Hi, I'm Tony Northrup for Train Signal, and this video lesson is part of the SSCP certification videos, and it covers logical access controls. Let's get right into it by talking about the term subjects. Now, this is what the SSCP certification uses, but it's kind of an unusual term. Subjects are anything that's going to be accessing a resource on a network. And the most common example of this is a user. Users sit at a computer and they access files and servers and other resources. And this is what we think of most of the time when we think of a subject. But in a modern network, a subject can really be many different things. Often apps themselves are subjects, and this isn't necessarily an app that's on an iPad, like in the example graphic, but it can be an app running on a server. For example, a web application that needs to access a backend database. When a user connects to the web server, the web server then needs to communicate on behalf of that user to a database. So the user is a subject, and the web server is a subject. And the user is accessing the web server as the object, and the web server is accessing the database as the object. So you can see that subjects can be many different things, and in fact, a subject can also be an object, as is the web server in this example. So to clarify, subjects access resources. Resources are also known as objects. Another example of a subject is a web service itself. Now, a web service is not the same thing as a web server. A web server receives HTTP requests from a web browser, and it sends back HTML pages with pictures and JavaScript and stuff. That's what a web server does. A web server speaks a little bit different of a language. Often it is based on HTTP, which makes things a little confusing, but there's another layer on top of it, such as SOAP. SOAP is just a particular protocol that web services use, but web services basically speak computer language and they exchange information just like any two apps would. So, for example, you could write an application that checked the weather. There are many services on the web that provide weather information, but you need to send them a web services request, which is a specially formed request generated by a web services client, such as a weather app on your iPhone. Another example of a subject is a computer. Now, you, we think of the user being on the computer, but computers themselves often need to authenticate to the network and directly access resources. For example, when you turn on your laptop computer in a corporate environment, that laptop needs to access resources on the network before you ever log in. So the laptop itself needs its own identity, and therefore it becomes a subject. And, you know, typically what it will be doing is proving that it doesn't have any malware installed on it, that it's an approved computer for use within the organization. So the computer is a subject, and the user on the computer is also a subject. Networks themselves can be subjects. Now, networks are typically resources, which the SSCP exam calls objects, but networks can be subjects as well because a server or a service can allow or deny access from particular networks. For example, you might set up a very important file server in an enterprise to only allow access from networks that have been physically secured. In this case, the network itself is a subject because the network has been authenticated and authorized to access the resource, which is the file server, the object. Now let's take a look at a few different objects. Files are the most obvious object. If you connect to a file server and you access some files, well, those are objects that require authentication and authorization before they can be accessed. Databases are a classic example of an object that a subject needs to access. And often, apps are both a subject and an object. For example, you can't let everyone in your organization run just any app. You might have an accounting app that only accountants could run because they would be able to see your company's important financial numbers. Therefore, you need to control access to the app itself. And the app, therefore, becomes an object. Web services often authenticate resources, meaning that they can be an object. But a web service can also be a web services client, meaning it can also be a subject. If you limit access to an entire network, 
if you only allow access to a network from users who are allowed to connect remotely, for example, that network is using authentication and authorization, and therefore it's an object. Objects are resources that are accessed, and subjects are users or other processes that access those resources. Finally, in the physical realm, facilities can be objects. You probably have a locking door on your house, and that is a form of both authentication and authorization, making your house an object that needs to be accessed. Now that we've discussed the differences between subjects and objects, let's talk about identification, authentication, and authorization. The first of those terms is identification, and that's just saying who you are. There's no proof or accountability for it, so I can say, I'm Tony Northrup, but you don't know that for sure, right? I haven't proved it to you. I've identified myself, but I could be lying, in other words. One step more advanced is authentication. Authentication is identification with a little bit of proof. So if I were to pull out my passport or driver's license and show it to you and you took it in your hand and you looked at the picture on my passport and held it up to my face and saw that it looked like the same guy, you'd be authenticating me. Now when I say here that the proof is secret, uh, what I'm really trying to say is that it's not easily forged. So me showing you my driver's license isn't secret. Suddenly that information is public and you could take a picture of it, but you couldn't easily reproduce it. You couldn't easily make a new passport or driver's license with my name and your picture. Uh, if you could, that would pretty much spoil the entire authentication. Now, in this particular example, people do make fake driver's licenses. They do make fake passports, but both driver's licenses and passports are designed to be difficult to forge. That's why we can trust the authentication. If you could simply write your name and draw a sketch of yourself and use that as ID and authentication, well, we wouldn't have a trustworthy authentication system anymore. And maybe you'd accept it as authentication, but it wouldn't be good authentication. So identification tells people who you are with no proof. Authentication backs that up, proving who you are if they trust the system of authentication that you're providing. Authentication, however, does not show that you can do anything. My passport, for example, doesn't necessarily prove that I'm allowed into train signals offices. It just shows who I am, but not whether I'm allowed in. That is the next thing that we're going to talk about. Here's some other authentication examples. You're probably most familiar with usernames and passwords. Now the username is the identification part. But the username, well, it's usually your email address, right? And that's not secret. You give your email address everywhere. The password, however, you keep it secret. And that's why it's useful as an authentication mechanism. A more modern example is a username and a picture password. It's just a, that picture passwords are a second form of authentication used by some mobile devices, tablets, and most notably uh, Windows 8 touchscreen interfaces. Another form of authentication is a Kerberos token, and we'll be talking about Kerberos in detail in a later lesson. But this is a little way that computers on a network can authenticate you and allow you to then prove yourself to every file server and database server that you come across. In our day-to-day -day life, we often use uh, credit cards and debit cards, and they both have an authentication mechanism built into them. Uh, for example, the Debit card, well, just holding a debit card is some form of authentication. After all, it's something you have. Not everybody has the exact same debit card with the exact same numbers encoded into it. They provide a second level of authentication by making you type a PIN. This is actually dual factor authentication, and we'll get into that a little bit later. When you use a credit card, well, you probably sign the back of the credit card, and then often the merchant requires you to sign a piece of paper as well. In theory, in practice, they're supposed to check the signature that you made and make sure that it matches the signature on the back of the card. If these match up, well, that's a form of biometric authentication, actually. It's proving who you are because you can easily reproduce a signature that's not easily reproduced by other people. Another common authentication example is a smart card in an organization. Enterprises often provide smart cards to their employees to help prove who they are. Usually these are matched to a PIN so that somebody can't just steal your smart card and instantly prove who they are. They don't know that PIN, 
well, they're not going to be able to uh, authenticate themselves as you. Nowadays, certificates are a frequent way of authenticating people. Uh, we'll learn more about certificates and cryptography a little bit later on, but when computers need to authenticate to computers or apps or databases or anything machine oriented, well, they can't pull out a uh, picture ID, right? So certificates are basically the government IDs used by processes and computers and software. On a regular basis, we all have to whip out a government ID and it has a picture on it, as you can see. These uh, two very enthusiastic government ID owners are, are proving who they are with quite some pride. Well, I don't usually get that excited when I get carded, but the government ID does authenticate you by matching your face to the picture on it. It, in fact, also provides a few elements of authorization. For example, it shows your birth date on there and it probably says whether or not you can travel out of the country or drive. So this actually mixes in authentication and authorization, which we're going to talk more about later. And finally, there are many different forms of biometric authentication, which prove who you are. These are things like retina scanners and fingerprint scanners, and it's all really cool and we'll talk about it in more detail later on. Now let's talk about authorization. Authorization is just showing that you have permission to do something. And typically it happens after you've proved who you are. Here are some examples of authorization in our day-to-day -day life. If you're on a network and you're accessing a file server, well, each file has a list of permissions that determines who can open the file, who can save the file, who can delete the file. These are file permissions, and that's a form of authorization. Now, sometimes they'll be public and they won't require any authentication at all, but usually in an enterprise, you first have to identify who you are, and the file permissions, the authorization mechanism, uses your identity, your authenticated identity, to determine your level of privilege. That's identification, authentication, and authorization all working together to grant just the right users access to different resources. User rights assignments are another good example of authorization. In a Windows operating system, there's a group for users and a group for administrators. Users have some user rights assigned to them. They can browse the file system and edit files in their own documents folders. Uh, administrators have more privileges. They're authorized to do more things. They're authorized to, for example, install new software, install updates. In this way, user rights are an authorization method. Often you're authorized simply by your network or physical location. For example, you might only be able to access a file server if you've connected to your enterprise's internal network. Sometimes you might be able to access resources just because you've managed to walk into a building. For example, your organization might have an internal phone book physically printed out that they put on everybody's desk so you know everybody's extension and who to call. Well, they don't want that information getting out. For example, headhunters could call everybody in the organization and try to recruit them to another company. But they limit access to that phone book by your physical location. They put it inside the building past a locked door. So until you can get past that locked door, you're not authorized to access that phone book. Encryption is also a common method of authorization. You can encrypt a file and just put it out there on the public internet and nobody will be able to read the actual data in the file unless they have a decryption key. So you control the authorization by granting that key to specific individuals and hopefully keeping it secret from the rest of the world. In enterprises, often they don't want computers connecting to their network unless they are proven to not have any malware. So this is a common authorization method. When a client computer connects to the network, sometimes it has to run a health check. And if it has all the latest updates and it's running some anti-malware, then it's granted access to the network. They're using the client patch level and health to authorize the client computer. Back in the real world, uh, if you're going into an airport, you go through both authentication and authorization processes. So the first thing you need to do is you need to get your boarding pass right, and you do that by putting in your government ID, your driver's license or your passport, those prove who you are, and it looks you up in a database to see if you're scheduled for a flight. If you are scheduled for a flight, then the machine, the kiosk, or the uh, attendant will print a boarding pass for you. 
This boarding pass is proof of your authorization. It's almost like a token in a Kerberos network. You can take that to the security desk and they will look at it. They'll probably actually scan it to make sure that it hasn't been forged and authorize you to enter. It probably has your name written on it too and they might just check your government ID again, re-authenticating you. So your government ID authenticates you and the boarding pass authorizes you to enter the airplane's gate. Now I mentioned driver's license is being used to authenticate you. They have your name and birth date and a picture of you and you can use biometric identification, matching the picture to your actual face to authenticate a person. But the driver's license also says things like, this person's allowed to drive at night. This person is allowed to travel out of the country. In this way, the driver's license is authorizing you to do things like drive or leave the country. When you're carted at a bar to drink alcohol, that's an example of authorization. They take your government ID and usually check your birth date to make sure that you're old enough to drink under the state's laws. The backstage pass at a concert is another form of authorization, working much like a boarding pass. Just the fact that you are holding that backstage pass grants you access past the security guards. And finally, my last example here, the you must be this tall signs at amusement parks. Well, it's there for everybody's safety, and it's an example of authorization without any kind of authentication. They don't care who you are or what your name is. They don't ask for ID. There's no authentication. If you can be that tall, you can walk through. So that's an example of pure authorization without any form of authentication. An access control system ties these things together. The access control system defines rules that probably require both identification and authentication along with authorization before granting you access to resources. So for all of these, there is a set of well-defined rules. If, if you think back to going through the airport, well, they have rules to check your ID before giving you a boarding pass. They probably also have rules to make sure that you're not on some list of potentially dangerous people. Part of their access control system is to check your bags to make sure that you don't have anything that might be hazardous to the other people on the airplane. And they always check your boarding pass both when you go through security and at the airplane. These are rules and they're well defined and they're part of the overall access control system. In the IT world, these access control systems can also be very complex. For example, if I need to access a confidential file on my internal network, I will first need to connect to an authorized network, such as the internal physical network. Then I'll need to log on to maybe a domain using my username and password, so it requires authentication. At that point, the file server will accept my request, but compare my credentials against a list of people approved to access the file and determine whether I'm authorized to read it or edit it or delete it and make sure that every request I send to it is authorized specifically for what I can do. There might also be auditing in that access control system. So every time I open it or change it, it might be recorded in a log file. This entire system of rules and processes is the overall access control system. Here's some other examples of access control systems. One is security clearance levels, and if you're not part of the government or military, you probably still know these from every TV show. You've heard of unclassified and classified and secret and top secret. Well, in the government, you're going to be assigned one of these depending on how trustworthy you are, basically. And if you're cleared for secret but not top secret, well, you'll be able to read secret documents, but you won't be able to read top secret documents. And their system of checking you out and making sure that you're not a bad guy, that you're not prone to giving away secrets or lying, and then assigning you an access clearance level that defines which documents you can access, that's all an access control system. The whole process that governments have set up for issuing government IDs with pictures and then putting laws in place to make sure that bartenders check your ID before giving you a drink, well, 
this is an access control system. There's even more to it because they have audits, right? They will send in a 20 year old and have him ask for a drink, but he's really working undercover. And if they serve him a drink without carding him, well, that audit will prove that they are not following the access control system correctly. So in that way, they have an access control system that helps to make sure it stays in place and works properly. And cars always have some sort of identifying factor. In most countries, they have a license plate. And in many places, they also have an inspection sticker to make sure that the car is safe to operate on the roads. So the license plates and inspection stickers are part of an access control system, but they're not the entire part. There is also the part where there are police officers driving around making sure that every car has a license plate. And if they don't, you know what? The access control system defines a process that the police officer can follow to pull you over and penalize you in some way and remove your car from the road and make sure that you get a license plate. In a similar way, if you don't have an inspection sticker, well, there's a process for auditing that, determining it, finding you, and making sure that you get your car checked out. This is all part of one huge access control system that we deal with every day without even thinking about it. Credit card systems are an access control system too. You swipe your card, but that's not the end of it. Often the checkout person is going to check your signature and make sure that it's really you. The little machine that you scan your card into, it's gonna communicate with a central server and make sure that you have enough funds and that you're authorized to spend it maybe at that time of day and in that particular location. Uh, to prevent from credit card fraud, this access control system has gotten really complex in recent years and they'll actually monitor your behavior. And if you're an American resident and suddenly there's a charge that goes through in Africa, well, this might trigger an alarm in the access control system and block access to that credit card until you call up and say, hey, it's really me. I can authenticate myself in a secure way and I really am in Africa, so please let these charges go through. It's a credit card access control system. And encryption itself can be an access control system because you can't access encrypted data unless you have a certificate. So in that way, you're controlling access to your data. In the IT world, a typical access control system has properties like these. You can control the strength of the authentication by controlling password complexity and how often users can change passwords. We're gonna go into a lot of detail in that in later lessons. You can also manage your subjects, which are your users. You can create accounts, you can reset passwords, you can disable accounts. Typically, you won't allow the authentication system to allow easily forged subjects. That's why they make your driver's licenses pretty hard to forge. They put holographic images on there and little electronic things that can be scanned. I can't make that in my bubble jet printer at home. They make it intentionally difficult. They do this with uh, currency too. They typically lay in little fibers and metals that are just really difficult to reproduce on conventional machinery. So they try to make things that are not easily forged. IP addresses in particular are pretty easily forged. And you know, when I was a uh, youngin <laughs> in the uh, early to mid nineties working in IT, it was really common for us to control access to servers just based on your IP address. So we would just say, everybody on the 192.168.2.0 network will have access to this file server. And we thought, you know what, we only allow people we trust to connect to that particular network. So we're using physical security, right? Then things like IP forging came out. People can forge IP addresses and uh, change your routers and that allowed other people to gain access to resources. So nowadays, IP addresses aren't used as a form of authorization very often. If they are, it's secondary, kind of a belt and suspenders level of protection, but they're not used as the only form of authorization because they're easily forged. And anything that would be easily forged would be quickly abused. You know, 50 years ago, driver's licenses weren't all that complex. They actually were pretty easily forged. And as a result, people just forged them and they just did what they wanted. The same thing with most countries' currencies. The first few currencies that any country had were just some stuff printed on paper. And you know what? People figured out how to fake it pretty quickly. You've heard the phrase wooden nickel before. Well, that was real. People would just forge a nickel, make it out of uh, wood, and then put some coating on it. And that worked. 
And because people will always abuse something that's easily forged, that's protecting access to valuable resources, well, you have to make sure that things aren't easily forged. Most access control systems automatically grant access to the owner who creates an object and allows that owner to control the permissions assigned to it. So if I'm on a network and I make a new file, well, it's going to grant me complete control over that object and give me the ability to say who can and can't access it. So object owners determining object permissions is a common trait in modern access control systems. And in most modern access control systems, they deny access to everybody by default. It wasn't always that way. In early versions of Windows, I recall you could make a new file and it would give everybody full control over it by default. And then if you wanted it to be secure, well, you had to go in and change those permissions. Nowadays, secure by default is the name of the game. So nobody but you can get access to it by default. And if you want to share it, well, you have to go through steps to do it. It makes a little more pain if you want to share everything you do, but often that inconvenience is worth it by minimizing your security risks. Most modern access control systems don't allow you to transfer user IDs. So I'm Tony Northrup. If somebody comes into the organization and they're going to be doing whatever my job is, it would be tempting just to give that person Tony Northrup's ID, right? That's not a good idea, and technically there might not be anything to allow it, except logistically there'll be rules in place to say every user must have a uniquely identifiable ID. Even if they want the exact same privileges, well, they need their own ID for auditing purposes. So that, you know, six months from now, when the person who took over my job does something illegal, well, they need to be able to prove that it was him and not me. Therefore, I don't want anybody else to have my ID because they could do something bad and make me look terrible. <laughs> and for that reason, access control systems typically don't allow IDs to be transferred from one user to another. And the last example that I list here is that subject and object access can be audited. And again, there, I can think of lots of systems, you know, 10, 20 years ago that didn't provide any sort of auditing. But nowadays, every system I can think of, whenever you do something, it gives you the option of recording something in the log. Auditing typically isn't enabled by default because it can use up a lot of resources and create just a lot of junk in your log files that you don't care about. But it is part of the access control system. And in fact, many organizations and many government regulations require that access control systems implement auditing and store those logs for a certain amount of time. So let's quickly take a look at how to protect files with file permissions. This is the authorization part of it, but it's part of an overall access control system. And, and I bet you've done it before, but maybe you haven't looked at it in exactly this way. And this is File Explorer on the Windows 8 desktop. And I'm going to create a new file that I want to keep secret. So to view the properties, I can just right click it and then click properties. And I'll click the security tab here to view the file permissions. And we can just see an example of what Windows 8 does with the default permissions. And I'll, I'll just say that the SSCP exam isn't going to test you on whether you know that these are listed on the security tab of the file properties dialog box. In fact, they won't test your ability to do anything. The SSCP exam tests your conceptual knowledge. I am providing this only as an example of an implementation because I want it to be a little more concrete and a little less abstract. So this is how one particular operating system implements authorization as part of an overall access control system. You can see that by default it grants access to three different users. The system, which is literally Windows, uh, me, I created the object, and you can see that I have full control over it. I mentioned that access control systems usually give the owner creator of an object full control. You can see that this also gives administrators full control. So there's a group which is often known as a role called administrators that's built in by default in Windows and administrators need to have the ability to access any file on the system. Now you'll notice that there's no everyone listed here because everyone has no access to it. Most access control systems deny access to everybody by default, and because it doesn't say everybody there, only the system, Tony Northrup, me, 
and someone who's a member of the administrators group will have any access to this file whatsoever unless they find a way to bypass that access control system, which they could do, for example, by booting from a live CD that didn't respect the file permissions that I've assigned to it. Down here you can see specific privileges assigned to users. I could, for example, grant write access, but remove full control access, which allows the user to change permissions. Or I could give them read access, but remove all the other access rights if I wanted somebody to be able to view a file, but not change it. These are typical properties of any operating system, file permission system. It's an access control system, so you'll see the same things in Mac OS and Unix. So let's take a look at authorization of a different type, and this is user rights. We're not controlling access to a particular resource, but rather we're listing specific tasks that a user can do and granting them access or denying them access based on their role. This is the local security policy tool in Windows 8, and it controls user rights. You can see I've selected the local policies and then user rights assignment node. And I'll just look at a couple of these settings. First one I'll look at is change the system time. And as you can see, by default, it gives access to the local service, which is just part of the Windows 8 operating system itself, and the administrators group. But you'll notice nobody else is listed by default. And I mentioned most access control systems deny access by default. So if you weren't specifically listed, you don't get to change the system time. So why would Windows only want administrators and the operating system to be able to adjust the system time? Well, because many authentication systems grant you a token that says this user can access things for a certain amount of time. Therefore, if you manipulate the system time, you might be able to make that token work for longer than was otherwise required. Therefore, you don't want just anybody changing the system time. That's a user right that needs to be limited to only certain privileged users. On the other hand, the time zone doesn't require that same level of privilege. Users need to be able to change the time zone as they travel. If I fly from the East Coast to the West Coast, well, it's going to be really confusing to me if the clock on the computer keeps showing me the East Coast time. So as a standard user, I need to change the time zone, and there's no particular security problem with doing that. So in this way, the user rights assignments provide authorization after a user has been authenticated, limiting access to different tasks on the computer. This is part of the access control system and a good example of authorization. This is Tony Northrup for Train Signal, and thanks so much for watching this video lesson.